Welcome to Philly Prime. I'm Dave Schrapweiser. Today, the state of the Philly mob. Indictments, pleas, some guys going to jail, kind of shaking things up in Philadelphia. And who better to talk about that with than my old friend, George Anastasia, the author, journalist, professor, <laughs> and all-around mob expert from Philadelphia for years now. George, welcome to the show. It's good to have you back. Thank you, Dave. Always a pleasure to be here, man. All right, George, um, I'm interested in uh, all your years of kind of watching the Philly mob. How, wh what is the state of the union of the Philly mob right now? We have some, obviously, uh, indictments and people going to jail. Kind of give us the description of where we are right now. Well, I, you know, I think this crime family, I think like crime families all over the country are, are struggling to figure out what it is they can do and where they can succeed. And, and uh, there isn't. I, I think things have changed so much in the past 20 years that there isn't a lot out there in terms of opportunities. And I think the Philadelphia family have kind of epitomizes that. We do have an indictment involving some, some loan sharking, gambling, and drugs. Um, but by and large, there are guys out there who, I, they just seem to be floating. We, you know, we don't know a lot about what anybody's into, but it doesn't seem to be all that very much at all. And I think that's the state of organized crime across the country. It's, it, so many opportunities have disappeared in terms of gambling, in terms of you know, legalized gambling, the legalized lottery, it's taken away opportunities. Yeah. And I, one thing that I think we've seen in this particular case is indicative of that is guys drift into drugs because drugs is a place to make money. Yeah. But the, the dangers are, are significant there. And I think that's what we're seeing in this pending case. There's some guys looking at very serious jail time. And, uh, you know, I don't know, the state of the Philadelphia mob, I think, you know, we can, you and I can sit here and probably identify 20 guys. Yeah. That's who the members are. It, Here's the structure as best we know it. Here's the boss, here's the street boss. But what are they up to? You know, not very much. I would say not very much at all. Yeah, even the violence has really kind of gone away. We haven't had a mob hit in Philadelphia since 2012. Um, even across the country, I mean, some of what I hear out of New York is, you know, the, the head of the five families, they don't want violence because heat in one family can bring heat in another family. Yeah, I think they've learned over the years that violence generates, one, it generates internal problems, and two, it attracts more law enforcement. And, and I think these guys want to stay in the shadows. Again, it comes back to, are they making enough money to survive? That's what it always comes down to. It's always about the money. Yeah. And I think some of these guys are, uh, by the, their lifestyle, you could say, yeah, they're doing okay. But in terms of the overall organization, I think it's a, it's a shadow of what it was maybe 15, 20 years ago. Yeah, are they hesitant to get into anything too big now? Because most of them are getting up a few years in age, just like you and I are. Um, they're in their late 50s, 60s. A lot of them have done 10 to 15 years in prison. Some in the Scarfo group have done upwards of 25 years. There's, is there a hesitancy, you think, to get back involved in anything too serious because you, you're worried about the risk right there, which is going to jail for a long time. And at 60, jail time is a lot harder than it is when you're in your 20s, 30s. And 40s. Yeah, I think that's part of it. I think, you know, if, you, if you're looking at a 10 year sentence, it, it amounts to almost a life sentence if you're in your 60s. I mean, it, it, it takes away what little life you have left. I think that's one of the factors. Uh, the other factor I think is, is um, what's to be gained as opposed to what is your risk? And there isn't that much to be gained right now. That's what it seems to me. It's just, there's, you know, the risk reward kind of thing. There isn't that much to be gained by taking that risk and getting involved. I think a lot of guys are content to, you know, I guess sit in a club, have a couple of beers, talk to some friends, bullshit one another, do that kind of stuff. Yeah. And uh, there isn't a lot of, uh, there isn't, I, I think, I guess the entrepreneurship is the word. Um, who are the entrepreneurs and where are they taking the organization? Where is their money to be made? Um, and, and right now, uh, the traditional gambits, gambling, loan sharking, they're still there, but to a lesser degree than they were 20 years ago. Um, and the other alternative is drugs. And, and th that takes you down a dark road. Yeah. As we see in the case, the current case right here, uh, Dominic Grandy, Capo and the family, uh, up and cumber, uh, early 40s. Looking at drug charges, Joe Servideo, a bunch of other guys. Those are serious charges. And uh, Dominic is scheduled to have a plea hearing, to change a plea hearing coming up uh, in about a week or so. 
Um, he's looking at 10 plus if he went to trial and he was convicted. This time we're hearing he might get something like seven. So there's big consequences for going down that road. Yeah, and I, I, mean, I think Dominic is a guy, he's the face of the next generation of the Philly mob. And already he's jammed up here in this drug case. And we know that, you know, the, the, the feds have a murder investigation they'd like to put him in the middle of, have not been able to do that. So he's a guy who has a lot at stake here. And taking the plea is probably going to reduce his jail time significantly. And I, I think that's that's what he's decided. Let me let me go this way and avoid trial and uh, see where else I can go after that. I mean, that, that's something that bears watching is what does he do after he finishes this sentence? Is there more to come? You know, we keep hearing they're working this, they're working that. You and I both know there's several, I don't want to say seven, there's several, several mob hits that have not been prosecuted that they would like to prosecute can they do that uh, that's always in the cards here and, and the other thing you know we didn't mention it yet today is one part of the reluctance of these guys is somebody's always an informant or somebody's wired up i mean look at this philadelphia crime family per capita probably more tapes than any other crime family in america yeah. if you look at it over the years you want to go all the way back to George Fuzz alone, and then through the Avena tapes, and then the Ronnie Previty tapes, and now the Anthony, Anthony Persiano tapes. Uh, this is a phenomenal negative for this organization. You know, yeah. speak into the mic, for, speak up a little bit. I can't quite hear you. The, yeah. the feds have been gangbusters in terms of electronic surveillance with this crime family, and consequently, they paid a really, really significant price. Yeah, look at this case because you have a mob induction ceremony on tape, and even the after party on tape. And there's some damning comments on there and everybody's present. Um, you and I have talked about this on Mob Talk Sit Down. This will be a tape that lives on for a long time because there are a lot of other guys on that tape who are not being prosecuted in this case. And if they can ever kind of link up the money and the dominoes here, that tape's going to get played and played and played again if there are any future prosecution. Yeah, I mean, the, that tape is a tool that the government has uh, ready to use if and when. But, you know, we've been talking if and when for must be five, yeah. six, seven years now. I, I don't know. I, you know, um, and you know what else is, I, I think, happening? And this is, I think, to the benefit of these guys is there are a lot of people in the Department of Justice and in the FBI who have started to, to lose interest in this organization mm -hmm. because it's not doing that much and because there are other priorities. And that could work to their advantage if they get smart and go back into the shadows and you know, find things that can generate some income, but not generate a lot of headlines. Yeah. That's, that's always been the problem with this family is headlines and tapes. Yeah, we got carjackings, murders at a record high in Philadelphia, shootings. The FBI Violent Crime Task Force is uh, hard at work helping out the Philadelphia Police Department and other police departments yeah. uh, around the country. You know, they have the best technology. They have the best evidence recovery teams, those kind of things. There's demands. There's pull on the FBI, too to get involved in other things. And, and you could see how organized crime, especially in Philadelphia, might drop down a peg or two in, in the level of importance here. Yeah, you've got to prioritize your, your use of resources. And I, that's what I'm saying. I mean, if you're looking at it from a law enforcement perspective, I think there are a lot of things that are having a greater impact on society than the wise guys. Yeah. And if the wise guys are smart, they'll figure out a way to take advantage of that, stay in the shadows, work whatever little scams they're working and not call attention to themselves. I think that's where we are. Uh, you know, I mean, think about it. I mean, Joey Merlino, the alleged boss of this crime family, is by and large in Florida. What's he doing down there? How does he how does he continue to live the way he's living? What's yeah. the source of income? You know, and the supposition is there's money flowing from here down to there. That's the supposition, but nobody's been able to, to, to document any of that. You know, nobody's been able to establish a money trip. So all of those things are sitting out there. We don't know, and I'm, I'm not sure the feds know. The other thing is, I'm not sure the feds are making that big an effort to find out anymore. That's that's where we may be right now in 2022. Yeah. Let's um, uh, talk about another guy who's going to go away here is uh, either by plea or, you know, go to trial here uh, and potentially could go away, I should say. Steve Mazzone, former underboss of the crime family, uh, very high ranking guy. He's looking at a uh, loan sharking uh, gambling kind of conspira uh, racketeering conspiracy charges, no drugs. He's due to go on trial in September with his brother, Sonny Mazzone. Um, if they lose Dominic 
Randy and they lose Steve Mazzone, you've lost two big members of that wing of the family right there. No, absolutely. Uh, and, and, yeah. As you mentioned earlier, if, if Steve Mazzone goes to trial, he'll be the first one to pay a price for that tape because that tape will be played. It's a significant tape in terms of his status within the organization. Uh, you know, and you, you know, you see defense attorneys make this argument, well, it's, it's not a crime to be part of organized crime. It doesn't mean anything. Well, from a juror's perspective, if you're making an organized crime case and you've got other evidence to show loan sharking and gambling, and you've got a tape where the guy is basically a leader of the organization, you're paying the price for that tape. So yeah. if there's a trial, I think Stevie Mazzone will be the first person who gets hammered because of that tape. Yeah, and he's the principal yeah. voice on that tape, you would agree, based yeah, on the tape. Absolutely, you know, and, you know, let's plant our flag, let's do this. Those kind of things are kind of marching orders for the rest of the organization, and it establishes him as a leader, which is what the government wants to say in this case. That's why I think the smart move is probably to take a plea. And if the numbers are decent, and we're here, and they're not, I mean, nobody wants to go to jail. Right. But Especially at their age now. They're all, they're turning 60, each, you know, that group of uh, organized crime figures in South Philly. Joey just turned 60. The zones in that range. A few of the other guys. But if you're looking at five years as opposed to 12 years, you know, you do the numbers, do the math. I mean, it's, it's you're going to do 85% or whatever you get. And if they're offering you five on the table and you run the risk of 12 to 15 if you're convicted, you know, you got to you got to make some choices. Not yeah. good choices, but that's the only choices you got. And these days, you know, you do 85% plus you usually go to a halfway house a year or six months towards the end of your sentence. You know, five years looks like three and a half or yeah. three, year, three years and eight months. Yeah, and I think that's the evaluation you've got to make. And I think, you know, we've talked about this before. I think if they can clear the decks here and if they can get Servidio, the drug dealer, out of the case that they're in right now, um, then I think we'll start to see some serious negotiations about trial or plea. I think yeah, that's that, what we're going to We'll talk about that for a second. Joseph Servidio is a convicted drug trafficker in New Jersey doing 15 years. He was in one trial group that was supposed to go on trial in July. Those guys have pretty much pled out. There's right. one, one or two more pleas to go in that case. So the judge has shifted him over to the Mazone trial, which is in September, right after Labor Day. And uh, the Mazone camp is none too happy about that. Neither is anybody else in that group. They don't want to be sitting next to a convicted drug trafficker facing drug charges when they are not. And they don't want to hear those drug tapes. Exactly. That's another situation. You've got the drug tapes that will be played for the jury in the case, even though they're not charged with drug dealing. So, you know, th that can overlap and impact them. The other, the other thing is we've talked about this as well. So video wants out. So video is basically saying this is double jeopardy. Yes. Let out to this in New Jersey. I shouldn't be tried for the same charges again. Um, so there's a lot of different dynamics at work here. Um, you know, it seems to me, and, and again, you, you don't know what's going on behind the scenes, but I know a lot of a lot of judges like to streamline and get things resolved. And I think there will be pressure brought to bear on, on the U.S. Attorney's Office to work out a deal. From Servidia's perspective, if he can get a sentence that runs concurrent with go. what he's already doing, it's really a non-sentence. You know, if you're doing 15 and you get 8, 10 concurrent, it's, it's nothing. You, you just take the deal. So, I mean, that's another element that's, that figures in all of this. And I think by the, you know, by summertime, this will get resolved. I mean, one way or the other, we'll know if we're going to, because I think the judge wants to get this thing resolved. September is a pretty hard and fast date. And we'll either have a trial or police, and away we go. We have a precedent for that here. Victor DeLuca, who was charged with drugs in this case, uh, he, he's already doing, I think he's until 2026. He got a 10 year sentence. Uh, he's got to do six of it concurrent and like three and a half. Addition, Carl Chianese uh, is doing a jail sentence currently. He got five years. That's running concurrent yeah. with his current sentence. So there is a little bit of a precedent from this judge and this group of FBI agents and U.S. prosecutors to, to allow that to happen. Yeah, and if you look at the, the appeal uh, that Servideo's lawyer put in, that's pretty compelling when he's comparing yeah. the charges in Jersey and the charges in this case. I think there, there are one or two deviants, but the rest is basically, it looks like the same case. So yeah. we'll see how that plays out. But I, I think he's got a legitimate argument there. Yeah. He did a nice side-by-side -side chart in his yeah. papers, uh, the current charges and the Jersey charges. And, and it does, you know, looking at it, there is some deviation that the FBI and the U.S. Attorney's Office answered back basically saying, no, these are different charges, yeah. different time periods, 
And if you look closely at it, you'll see that charges are different and he should be tried for those charges. And that's what makes a ball game. You know, you have the same set of circumstances and two different arguments. That's why we have trials. That's why we have judges. So we'll see. But it's, it's again, it, it's a situation where the Mazzone brothers who are charged with loan sharking and gambling don't want to be at the table with a drug dealer. It just, it, 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 you know, because here's what's going to happen. It's going to be an argument that this is the Philadelphia mob. This is what they do. Here are some members of the Philadelphia mob. Right. And, and here is Steve Mazzone on this tape as one of the bosses of the organization. And here is a video, a member of this organization out there dealing drugs. It doesn't take much psychologically for the jurors to start making connections. And that works against Mazzone. The perception of Mazzone is, is a mob boss in an organization where drugs are, are being sold. And, and that's, and, it, and it's probably not fair. Yeah. It's gonna see, be interesting to see how this all shakes out if they even do go to trial in September. If the U.S. Attorney's Office makes another pass and lowers their offer a little bit, uh, I think the Mazzone brothers would take an offer if it was low enough. Uh, right now, their, their attorneys are basically saying, we will go to trial and we will fight these charges. Uh, that's their intention, but let's see if something better comes down the line here. After Dominic Grandy enters his plea or changes his plea on May 25th. Yeah, I mean, the, that's the leverage the Mazzone's have. The, the leverage they have is we can force a trial. And, and if you, the judge, don't want a trial, if you, the prosecution, are being told by the judge, let's settle this, then that's the leverage that his own time. And it, it all comes down, then it becomes a numbers game. What number are you willing to take? Okay. You know, five for Stevie and, and two for Sonny, is that good enough? Or, you know, there's got to be something less than that. Or let's fight. <laughs> it's going to be one or the other. Um, George, you talked before about 20 members I think total, you could look at the whole group and say maybe 20 to 30. Um, you get this question all the time. I get this question all the time. You already kind of covered Joey, but let's talk about the pecking order here. I think based on what we just saw at Joey Merlino's 60th birthday party at a very swanky place in, on North Broad Street, uh, two to 300 guests um, from all over the country um, allegedly, reputedly, still the boss, Joey Merlino. And then where do we go from there? Well, I mean, if you, if you follow what the feds are alleging, I think everybody alleges that Mike Lancelotti is the street boss. You know, he's the guy on the streets running the organization such as it is. I don't know, but, you know, he's certainly a low profile kind of guy. Uh, his name pops up all the time, but he's never been indicted. So he's a player. Steve Mazzone's a player. Dominic Grandy's a player. Uh, George Borghese, as much as he would want to deny it, is perceived as a player. Right. And those are the guys. That's I think that's the hierarchy. Um, you don't hear much anymore about John Changalini. He's out. Yeah, he seems to have taken a kind of a step back. It appears to me, maybe um, the wiser, a little bit older guy, who you go to for some counseling or whatever, but not actively involved. Yeah, or he might be taking some advice from his dad, Chicky Changalini, and basically saying, you know, what are you doing here? This is you're going yeah. to get nowhere with this kind of stuff. So, I mean, that's that's kind of the hierarchy of the organization. Joe Lagambe is another semi-retired guy who's right. still out and about. Anthony Stano is back from jail, but I don't I don't see him getting involved in any of this anymore. No. Um, you know, we, you know, and then, then there's some young up and comers, I guess, that want to make a name for themselves and want to get involved. But yeah. as I said, there's there's not a lot of activity that we're aware of, and I think if there were activity, we'd see more action from the FBI. We're just yeah. not seeing it. Interesting, in, on the induction tape, Joe Legambi is on there as well, yeah. uh, kind of describing uh, who each person he's introducing is yeah. uh, in a very active role there. Um, I know he ran the mob in Philadelphia from 2000 to 2018. There's a lot of stuff that occurred between 2000 and 2018 that the feds would love to pin on him. Again, that tape could come back to haunt him if they could ever do it, but he's 83. Three, I think now, 82 or 83 years old, spends most of his time at his house in South Philadelphia, living a nice, relaxed, easy life. Can't see him wanting to go to, back to prison either. Oh, yeah, and you see the same thing for Joe Licata up in Newark. I mean, that's, that's the capital up in Newark, for the, the Newark wing of the crime family. There's another guy who's living well, uh, has plenty of wherewithal to you know take care of himself. Yeah. And, uh, 
but still somewhat involved, showed up at Joey's birthday party. Yeah. We have some video of him coming and going with some of the folks from the Lugazi crime family, as a matter of fact. Yeah, I mean, that's the other thing with that birthday party that, that you know, Joey's connections up in the North Jersey, up in the New, New York, even up into New England. I mean, I think they still exist. To, the question is, to what end? Are they just friends, guys hanging out? Uh, the feds would, you know, kind of roll their eyes at that. These guys yep. are in some kind of business together. They, or they're in the business of making money. And, and how do they go about doing that? Yeah. You know, I mean, one of the things we saw when with one of the last cases against Joey was the medical insurance fraud stuff. He tap danced away from that. Some other guys weren't quite as lucky, but I think that's an area where a lot of these guys see a potential for making money and it's quasi legitimate. This yeah. pain management stuff and compound creams and all of that. It's, it's such a, a, a nebulous kind of thing that, you know, if you got the right connections and you got the hooks into the right people, you can probably make some money and make it, appear to be legitimate money yeah uh, who knows i mean i think there are clearly guys making money out there and they would argue they're making money legitimately i think the feds would argue uh, whatever they're doing bears watching yeah interesting uh, a guy both you and i know and i won't use his name on the podcast here but said uh, he had a little free time last week and he took a walk through the new live casino down in in uh, South Jer South Philly, excuse me, right in the heart of downtown South Philadelphia. And he said, you know, I walked around in there, they had sports book in there, poker tables, poker room, you know, any game you want to play, you can gamble away, borrow money, do whatever you got to do right there at the casino. And he, and he kind of stood in the middle of the thing and says, what's left for the Philly mob? Yeah. And I mean, it's right there at their doorstep in a brand new facility. It's a gorgeous place, uh, very popular with a lot of guys. Uh, a lot of guys hang out there, coming and going, like to play a little bit while they're down there. Just uh, it kind of rings true. I mean, everything that they did that were real money makers is now been replaced by legal gambling and all that. Yeah, I mean, I, I, across the board, there. You know, um, I think casinos create a market, though. And I think there's ways that you can generate income off of that market. I mean, you, 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 you get a guy who gets serious into gambling and he, and he needs to borrow money. Where's he going to go to get the money? Yeah. Even the guy who wants to gamble, and he, but he doesn't have the money, he can gamble on credit with a, a bookmaker. There are ways that they can siphon off or make benefit from the existence of a casino. I think some of that is going on. And there's all the ancillary services and all that kind of stuff. I mean, they... Traditionally, I mean, in the early days of Atlantic City, we saw that where they had their hooks into a lot of different things uh, in and around the casino industry. Yeah. I don't know how much of that still goes on, but it's certainly an area. I'm assuming it's an area that both the feds and the Pennsylvania Gaming Commission are watching. But with that Gaming Commission in Pennsylvania, you never know. I mean, they're, yeah. they're very tight, tight lipped. And uh, yeah, my sources tell me Joey played a little visit to. Uh, that casino a couple of months back. He's on the exclusion list yeah. in Pennsylvania as he is in New Jersey and I think out in Vegas. Um, and kind of went kind of quietly. They approached and asked him to leave. I think he made an argument that he's not been served with any papers saying he's on the exclusion list and politely left. But, you know, it wasn't like a big scene. Yeah. But I hear where they were just up and move him out kind of thing. So uh, even that kind of situation says a lot well that's an old forest book argument too what wasn't me remember that in atlantic city and yeah we're going to get to that in part two on our funny mob stories uh for next week but uh th there is a couple of you know funny tales in there one of the things you talked about new revenue streams in, in joey's court if you hear the rumors that are still kind of floating around is that joey might do a podcast uh gambling <laughs> betting kind of odds making podcast with somebody in the know uh, backed by some guys who are willing to put up the money and potentially attach that to a casino um, and, 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 you know, give a go. We have all kinds of figures on uh, YouTube and doing podcasts, including us. Um, is this a way for him to go? He'd be the only acting mob boss, alleged mob boss I know doing that but uh, we have plenty of cooperators doing that right now well i mean you know you and, I, you and i have both followed joey's career so to speak uh one i don't think joey would do anything like that unless there's significant money up front right and i i, I don't think from a personality perspective that he would enjoy that i don't think he would 
And so the question is, could, could he sustain it if it became successful? And the third question is, if it's connected to a casino, can they do that? Can they be associated with an identified alleged organized crime figure? So yeah. there's a lot of different wrinkles in that. I mean, Joey's life story, Joey uh, as a celebrity, it's always been out there. And I think Joey's always been looking to cash in on that. But to sustain a podcast, I mean, you got to work at it and you yeah. got to be available. And you got to, the other thing is, you got to be I, a talker too. Well, yeah. I mean, I, you know, I, Joey doesn't I, talk, but his sentences are, you know, five to 10 words and he's done, you know. And I've sat down with him a lot and you come away saying, you know what? He didn't say anything. No. I mean, he's very, very, uh, good at that you know and you end up questions. asking like 50 questions to yeah. get those answers yeah so it, it, it's i would find it uh, i still find it hard to believe that he'll agree to do something like that yeah. one because of the i guess the weekly commitment he'd have to make yeah. it's just in terms of being available and and being willing to do all that and unless there's an, an absolutely gigantic paycheck involved and i yeah. would see it and some of the terms I've heard kind of thrown around, if he, if he were to do that, would be he wouldn't talk about organized crime and the mob, things like that. But I find it hard to believe you could sit down every week and do a podcast and that doesn't somehow bleed into the conversation. A well, bit I mean, you know, if you, and that's the problem. I think what you're seeing now on podcasts, guys like Sammy Garano and Michael Franzese talk openly about it because they're on the other side of it now. They, they, Gravano served his time and now he's in and out and, and he can talk about it. Joey has, um, for whatever, there's things that I think Joey cannot talk about, and, and yeah. I think things that he doesn't want to talk about. The other thing he has to worry about is, you know, he still owes the government money uh, um, for restitution on a couple of cases, a significant six-figure number. Um, what happens to the money he does earn in a situation like that, too? Yeah, I mean, there, there are so many different negatives in terms of him doing something like that. I would be surprised if he does, despite the rumors and the talk. Uh, it, it would surprise me if you went that direction. Okay. Let's talk about uh, the old Scarfo guys. They seem to have learned their lesson here, George, after a decade or two in jail. Most of them, are, all of them are out pretty much as far as I know um, or have passed away. Um, the guys who are out on the street, Joe Changlini, enjoying life in South Philadelphia. You can find him at a local spot down there almost every day. Seems to be enjoying himself. Joe Pungitor running his own business with houses, doing construction work, flipping. Philip Narducci runs a restaurant. He had a little brief run-in with federal authorities a couple of years back, did a year, came back out. He's running a very successful restaurant with his wife down in South Philadelphia. Some of the other guys uh, are also doing the house flipping thing, kind of buying and selling houses, renovating, that kind of stuff. Talk about a group who kind of has learned their lesson. I think that's them. Yeah. <laughs> You're correct there. Now, you know, I, I had lunch at Phil Narducci's place not that long ago, and he wanted to talk mostly about his show dog. He's got, he's got, you know, he's got, I forget what, what breed it is, but he's got a, a dog that's yeah. doing You're very up on well the end, right home. there in the middle of the restaurant on yeah, the side. Yeah. yeah. And he was really into that. I mean, you, you know, you got to give these guys some credit for that if they've been able to turn their life around and find something else that, that it, it, they have passion about. And it seems right. to be the case with him that restaurant and the show dogs. And if, if you've got those kind of things gone, you don't need all the other stuff. And I think that's what it comes down to is what is it that fills that, that need, that vacuum that existed when you were a wise guy and you were doing this, this, and this. Now you're not a wise guy. What is it you're going to do with your life? Some of them have found things to do and some of them can be successful at it. Uh, you know, it's it, it, we, we would call about being a square, you know, go, going to work every day, but that's the world. That's the life. If that's real life. And I think a lot of these guys from that era, and certainly a guy like Scarfo could have never done that. I mean, Scarfo was of a, a different mindset. Scarfo died in prison and, and probably rightly so. That's the kind of guy he was. Um, yeah. Or conversely, a guy like Phil Leonetti, who's out and about with a new identity, has has found a new way to, to survive and to, and to prosper. So yeah, I mean, there is life after the lap, whether you become a witness or whether you do your time and come out on the streets. And I think we're seeing that from the guys from the Scarpa era. Yeah, look at the Scafidi brothers. Tori Scafidi did his time, 25 plus. Uh, he's out and about, uh, doing very well down in uh, in Florida, I believe. His brother was a cooperator, yeah. also out, staying out of trouble, working hard every day, earning a living, 
not back involved in this kind of thing. So there is a, a life after the mob if you choose to take that path. Yeah, and, and some of these guys are proving that you can do it and, and be successful at it. Uh, others haven't. So, you know, I mean, I know a guy like Nick Caramondi. Nick Caramondi is living somewhere in middle America in a trailer park. And I, I think if he could come back to South Philadelphia, 19, circa 1980, yeah. is, that the, is that his era? 19, he would do it in a minute. I mean, yeah. that, that was who he was, and I think he misses that. Other guys are, are able to get past it. Yeah. Um, let's mention one other guy, Nicky Scarfo Jr., still working off a 30-year-plus sentence for the first-plus case that you covered and yeah. wrote about extensively, that kind of thing. His dad's passed away. His buddy in prison down there, uh, who he was close to, um, was transferred to another prison. Um, he's still in Fairton at the Federal Correctional Institute down there, still burning off time. And I think he's like 2033. Yeah. That's a I mean, long way away still. Don Mano, the, the defense attorney, said that the Nicky Scarfo Jr. is the dark legacy of his father. He's, the, the junior has paid a significant price for wanting to follow in his father's footsteps. Real casualty, you know? Yeah, to listen to his father and to, basically to drink the Kool-Aid. I mean, Leonetti, Phil Leonetti even said, I mean, Leonetti at one point told me, my uncle's going to get my cousin indicted or killed and very nearly got killed and he's been yeah. indicted multiple times. Yeah. Uh, his life is, is, is over. It's yeah. A, a sad commentary. And he's not a dumb kid. No, very smart guy. Very yeah. smart guy going to be in jail probably till his mid 60s yeah i mean to what not else? a lot left after that yeah what did he gain from from doing all that yes yeah. what does he do when he gets out you know he's a smart guy but does he have the wherewithal to do something significant with his life the rest of his life yeah i mean you know that's i think that's the problem with a lot of these guys and, and i think scarfo jr bought into whatever his father was showing whereas if you look at it his younger brother tragically tried to commit suicide and, and eventually died. And his older brother, Chris, doesn't want to, you know, change his name. Yeah, he's out. Yeah, so there, there you are. I mean, that's the, that's the legacy of Nicky Scarfo. If you want to. I mean, he, he was a violent, notorious mob boss, but at the end of the day, he was a terrible mob boss. Yeah. You know, a lot of these guys, I mean, we see that not only in organized crime, we see it in government as well. A lot of people like to be a boss, but they don't know how to be a leader. Yeah. I think Scarfo is an example of that. George, um, last question. Look into your crystal ball five years from now. Are we still going to be talking about the Philly mob? I, it was, I don't know if we will be, or somebody will be, yeah, but I'm not well, sure. anybody, maybe. Okay. Yeah, I'm not sure it'll be uh, front and center. You know, it's probably not front and center anymore. No. I, I know before I left the Inquirer, which was how many years now, 12 years? I mean, I was writing more about the drug gangs than the wise guys at the end. And I think one of the things that's happened is, uh, this is kind of a knock on the media, they don't have the resources to, to really get into what's organized crime today. You know, you, you, the media doesn't have the ability or the wherewithal or the desire or the resources to start writing that story because it's, it's labor intensive. But uh, that's... You know, is it the Russian organized crime? Is it Asian organized crime? Is it black organized crime? All of the above. Uh, that's, I think, where it's going. And five years from now, I think those will be the issues that are more significant. But I don't know that the media will be covering it, so I don't know where we'll be. It's easier for everybody to talk about the wise guys because we all know about the wise guys. Yeah. And Godfather movies and all of that stuff. Yeah. I don't think they want to invest the time on the TV side of things at this point, or the resources. And if something comes up that's a big indictment, they'll send a reporter, cover it for a day, maybe two days, and it goes away. Pretty yeah, much. I mean, the interesting thing, that this struck me the other day, if you talk about pop culture, and, and if you look at some significant kind of movies that are out there right now, they, the John Wick series of movies, and there's another movie called Nobody, which was a great movie. It, it all revolves around Russian organized crime. Yeah. So the entertainment industry has identified the up and comer, but I don't think the media, traditional media, has focused on mm -hmm. Russian organized crime. And that may be where we ought to be in five years. I don't know if we will be, but that's probably where we ought to be. All right, George, listen, uh, very entertaining. That half hour went very quickly, as it usually Always does when you're on the show. 
um, plenty to talk about. And one of the things we're going to talk about next week are some of the uh, funnier stories you and I have come across covering the mob over the years. Uh, I got four or five. I bet you probably have 20 or 25. It's a dark uh, comedy. Uh, yes, it is. Yes, it, yes, it is. And I, and I look forward to that conversation. So, folks, do me a big favor. Come back and visit us here on Philly Prime next week. George will be back on the show. We have some funny stories to tell, not always the serious stuff. Um, and, and, and it ought to be pretty entertaining, George. I look forward to it. Absolutely. All right. Thanks again. And thanks for listening this week. Come back and listen to Philly Prime next week. George Anastasia will be back on the show. Thanks for listening. Have a good week.